Don't expect a YTT cut of Thor Love and Thunder anytime soon. Why were some fans disappointed at notable character absences and a suspicious lack of god butchering? And how many death fakeouts are too much? These are the Thor Love and Thunder moments that really upset fans. Spoilers ahead. Christian Bale as Gore the God Butcher in Thor Love and Thunder looks pretty cool, all things considered. However, there were some fans who were very vocally upset that he doesn't really look like his comic book counterpart. While Bale's portrayal of the complicated villain has been largely well received, it makes sense why some fans would be upset. While comic book movies have been notorious in the past for being lax about how they adapted characters' backstories and looks, modern comic book movies have, for the most part, been much more faithful. Director Taika Waititi said in an interview with IGN that he expected that fans would think a more comics-accurate gore looked like Voldemort. After all, his pale, bald, noseless comic design does emulate the fantasy villain quite a bit. However, at the end of the day, the gore in Love and Thunder is still undeniably gore, and Watiti felt that the character's story was far more important than any visual similarities to other fictional villains. Thor Love and Thunder is a fun film, but it also touches on some dark moments and themes. After all, the main villain is literally named Gore the God Butcher, which sounds like the name of a Norwegian black metal band. As such, fans expected to see more intense, mature scenes, some of which were apparently left on the cutting room floor. In an interview with IGN, Christian Bale talked about one brutal sequence that never made it into the film. Bale said, Gore is a highly religious character at the beginning with tattoos displaying his piousness, and then he becomes disillusioned with that, and then literally just mutilates himself to get rid of that. It was perhaps a little bit too extreme to be included in the film, but there was a lot of wonderful stuff that we shot. Great scenes get deleted for a variety of reasons, and it sounds like this one was cut to make the film more broadly appealing. As Bale said in the same interview, some things can work, some things don't, and we want this to be a family film. My kids love it. Let's bring the rainbow. The morally ambiguous Loki is a fan favorite in the MCU for a reason. Loki is Thor's adopted evil brother and eventual arch nemesis, essentially the Joker to Thor's Batman. Of course, his true nature and morality became much more fluid over the years, much like the mythical Norse god with whom he shares his name. Loki made his live-action feature film debut in 2011's Thor and has been in every single Thor feature up until now. He's also the star of his own popular Disney Plus show, Loki. It's safe to say that fans like to see as much Loki as the MCU is willing to showcase. Unfortunately, it makes sense that Loki is absent from the most recent Thor film, as there's really no room for him in the already crowded narrative. Not to mention, he's currently considered dead to everyone in the current universe. Still, his absence was always going to upset fans, no matter what. I guess I'll just have to go to learn. Like I've always done. Sif, played by actress Jamie Alexander, was a familiar face in the first two Thor films. She was originally part of Thor's group of powerful Asgardian warriors who assisted him in fighting off Frost Giants and Loki in Thor. Those same warriors later helped bring peace to the universe after the destruction of the Bifrost in Thor The Dark World. Unfortunately, she was mostly out of the picture after that, to the vocal disappointment of some fans. As such, it was great seeing her again in Thor Love and Thunder. Sadly, we don't get to see her fight or really do anything cool. Instead, we see her already defeated after having her arm cut off by Gore the God Butcher. Beyond that, we also find out that she was only left alive by Gore so that she could give Thor a warning. Ultimately, it's disappointing that Thor Love and Thunder couldn't find a more interesting role for Sif to play. Fans speculated that the fan-favorite comics character Beta Ray Bill would appear in Thor Love and Thunder. Unfortunately, Beta Ray Bill didn't show up at all, not even as an easter egg as he did in Thor Ragnarok. For those who don't know, Beta Ray Bill made his comic book debut in 1983's Thor No. 337. Beta Ray Bill was an alien warrior who, despite his extremely monstrous appearance, was actually an honorable and brave hero, one who was worthy enough to be able to wield Mjolnir. The reason why Beta Ray Bill is so popular is not just because he was one of the first characters besides Thor to wield Mjolnir in the Marvel Universe. He also contributed to the creation of the comic book version of Stormbreaker. Hopefully, the MCU can find a way to fit him in the next solo Thor adventure. Next time, baby. The ending of Avengers Endgame implied that there'd be a lot of Guardians of the Galaxy screen time in the sequel. Some fans even referred to the potential sequel as As Guardians of the Galaxy. Sure, that title was never confirmed, but that just goes to show how the possibility of a true Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor team up had some fans pretty excited. To be fair, the entire first part of the movie is an extended montage of Thor working with the famous Guardians team. Still, fans who did want more Guardians of the Galaxy screen time were undoubtedly a bit disappointed, especially since early trailers implied they'd potentially be a bigger part of the plot. 
The death of Jane Foster, aka the Mighty Thor, is one of those scenes that was purposely meant to upset audiences. After all, Portman's portrayal of the new Thor was charming and fun, and it's sad when any fan-favorite character sacrifices themselves to save the day. What's even more upsetting is that she begins the movie suffering from a cancer diagnosis. While Mjolnir seemingly heals her and makes her a literal god, it's also what's stopping her from healing while in human form. This means that anytime she's out superheroing with Thor as Mighty Thor, she's getting closer and closer to death every time she lets go of the hammer. Her final sacrifice is extremely well done, with both Portman and Hemsworth selling the sadness and beauty of her ultimate heroic sacrifice. Still, that didn't stop some fans from complaining. Korg, the lovable Cronin, is at one point seemingly killed to the surprise of Thor and his friends. This happens while the gang heads to Omnipotent City, where the different gods of the universe congregate. The heroes are going there to try and warn Zeus about Gore the God Butcher and request the gods' help in defeating him. However, Zeus doesn't like being ordered around and would prefer to stay hidden in Omnipotent City, which causes a fight between the Asgardians and Zeus. During the attack, Zeus blasts Korg with his famous lightning bolt, which causes him to explode. The death was upsetting for fans who thought that the film killed off such a lovable character. Luckily, Korg comes back to life, as apparently Cronins just need their heads to survive. Speaking of Zeus, at the end of that fight, Thor sends one of Zeus's lightning bolts straight back into the Olympian's chest, seemingly killing him. This allows our heroes to escape from the god's omnipotent city with his weapon in tow. However, at the end of the film, during the post credit scene, it's revealed that, like Korg, Zeus actually survived the attack. He talks about how the people used to worship gods, but now call for superheroes in times of need instead. We then see that he's talking to his son, Hercules, who himself is a lesser-known superhero in the Marvel Universe. Unfortunately, Zeus's death was so satisfying that it's a bit upsetting that he didn't permanently pay for his arrogance. Furthermore, it's not like there weren't other ways Hercules could have been introduced in the post credit scene. It could have even happened during a funeral or something, for instance. One of the best parts of Taika Waititi's directed films is how he manages to carefully blend moments of drama with comedy. In the case of Waititi's MCU Thor films, he manages to blend in action and fantasy as well. When pulled off well, this blend of seemingly disparate genres can be incredibly compelling for audience members. However, that sort of tonal dexterity is hard to pull off at the best of times, and even the greatest filmmakers sometimes stumble. Waititi is no exception. While most critics enjoyed his previous Thor film, 2017's Thor Ragnarok, there were some fans who criticized its overuse of comedy at the expense of genuine emotion. Since Thor Love and Thunder deals with even heavier subjects, the margin of error is even slimmer than ever before. And according to some fans, Waititi wasn't able to stick the landing this time. In an interview with IndieWire, Natalie Portman revealed, There were whole sequences, planets, characters, and worlds that didn't end up in the movie that were hilarious and amazing, and that we spent a lot of time and energy on. Now, deleted scenes and abandoned plots happen with every movie, and co-writer-director Taika Waititi responded to a potential Waititi cut with some harsh words. He told NME, I've been thinking about director's cuts. I've watched director's cuts of a lot of other directors. They suck. Director's cuts are not good. Directors need to be controlled sometimes, and if I was to say, ah, you want to watch my director's cut? It's four and a half hours long. It's not good. There's a lot of cup of tea breaks in there. But is that true? Were all the best ideas shown on screen? As we've mentioned before, there is a curious lack of actual god butchering by the supposed or the god butcher. Furthermore, extending the runtime would allow us to see more of the Marvel cosmos, as well as tie up loose ends with characters from previous films. Those would include, according to Christian Bale, Jeff Goldblum's Grandmaster and Peter Dinklage's Dwarf Eitri. Heck, YTT wouldn't even need to necessarily add to the runtime. He could have culled other plot lines, possibly shortening the kidnapping thread or trimming the time spent with Thor hanging out with the Guardians of the Galaxy. This could have allowed more time to let Gore's art breathe. After four phases of grand, intertwined storytelling, the MCU rightfully deserves praise for its unprecedented success, especially compared to other would-be franchises. Anyone remember the Dark Universe? I'm offering you a partnership. You, evil incarnate. Me, your good friend Eddie Hyde. However, there is nonetheless a large portion of the fan base who feel that the most recent slate of Marvel movies have been kind of rudderless. And this makes some sense, as the previous phase has spent many years leading towards the ultimate conflict with Thanos and the universe-altering Infinity Stones. Having such a clear endgame in mind meant that even weaker installments of the MCU had a sense of purpose. To be fair, Phase 4 of the MCU has seen an influx of multiverse stories, which seems to be the new era's endgame. This started with Loki on Disney+, Plus, later becoming a main focus for the plots of Spider-Man No Way Home, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and presumably the upcoming Ant-Man Quantumania. However, Thor Love and Thunder didn't touch on any of that at all. 
Now, it's not like the film had to address the multiverse necessarily. There are certainly some fans who prefer standalone superhero adventures existing alongside the inevitable team-ups and crossovers. Still, it's a definite change from the tight plotting that defined the earlier eras of the MCU, making Love and Thunder feel somehow off. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.